Hi, I'm Diana Neeby, and I have a confession to make. I'm guilty of subjecting my students to death by PowerPoint. As teachers, we've probably all been there before. Some kids dozing off in the back corner of the room, others nodding robotically along in hopes of appearing engaged, and most struggling to comprehend whatever message it was we were trying to get across. If this sounds familiar, stay tuned. I'm here to evangelize life after death by PowerPoint. I started teaching high school English in a time of change, right as my school was mounting LCD projectors on ceilings and rolling laptop carts into our classrooms. Truth be told, during those first few years of teaching with technology, I was so focused on figuring out how to use the tools and create curriculum that my energy was poured into the presenter side of my slides rather than the student side. I wasn't really thinking about what it would be like for my students to process all the information that I fired at them one bullet point at a time. Fortunately, rethinking our multimedia presentations becomes pretty simple when we consider a few basic principles about the brain. When we're learning something new, information is handled by our working memory. The working memory has a limited capacity. It can only juggle a handful of different things at once. The working memory receives its information from the sensory memory, primarily through our eyes and our ears. And here's the key. The sensory memory has two channels, and those two channels pick up pictures and words. Now, because the working memory is limited, one way to maximize our processing power is by using both of those channels. Our brain does better with a combination of pictures and words than just words alone. Think of it like a TV. What happens to your understanding of a show if you're watching it without the sound? Or what if you step into another room and can still hear the show, but you can't see the TV? How well do you understand it then? You're likely to do best with both the pictures and the narration. So now let's take this analogy one step further. Remember how I said that the brain has a limited capacity and that it can only juggle so much at once? Well, same goes for those channels. When I was growing up, we had this television where if you clicked mute, it would automatically put the closed captioning script along the bottom of the screen. My TV intuitively knew how to maximize the capacity of my dual channel brain. It was like if the TV was on, it would feed me a constant stream of words and pictures. Sometimes the words were spoken narration and other times the words were written text, but it wouldn't give me both the spoken narration and the text. Have you ever tried watching a show with both the sound and the closed captioning on? It's super distracting. So assuming that you can hear and see the words clearly, the brain automatically tries to process both of them at the same time. And as a result, your limited working memory ends up working even harder to understand the same information. So now that we have a general idea of the audience experience in a multimedia presentation, let's take a look at some classroom examples. I went through my old PowerPoint files and dug up some of my very best, worst slides. I'm going to walk you through five rookie mistakes that I made, explain from the student perspective what went wrong in those presentations, and provide a few research-based solutions for finding life after death by PowerPoint. My first mistake was reading students a script. This beautiful slide comes from an introductory presentation to The Great Gatsby and the Jazz Age. I even made it all cute and jazzy with the piano keys along the bottom and the musical notation for bullet points. But the problem was that I literally read this script to my students about how Fitzgerald was never popular in his own time and died thinking he was a failure. And as I stood and delivered, my students' brains were working overtime trying to figure out if they should listen to me or read the screen. I know now that they can only juggle so much text at once. I was giving them redundant signals on the same channel. Written words and spoken words are all just extra words to sift through. So the solution that I learned is slides do not equal presenter notes. In fact, most programs actually provide an entirely separate space just for presenter notes. What I should have done is to write my bullet points and other comments in this section and actually design slides that were meant for my students rather than for me. In rookie mistake number one, I was the only person in the room who benefited from my slides. Whoops. My second rookie mistake was TMI, too much information. 
Here's a slide from my first year of teaching when I was trying to explain how the introduction to an essay is like a funnel. Talk about information overload! Between listening to me talk, reading the text on the screen, and trying to figure out which paragraphs went with which parts of the funnel image, my students had way too much to process at once. What I know now is that good multimedia design will take a complex idea and break it down for students. That means segmenting the concept into more digestible chunks, signaling to students how the concept is organized with contrasting color, fading, and highlighting, and timing the delivery of information so that the images on the screen match up with the narration as simultaneously as possible. Instead of sending my students into shock, I could have simply cleanly presented the image of the funnel and talked about how the introduction takes big picture ideas and funnels them down into one narrow but strong point. Then I could have walked them through the key parts of the intro, including the hook, followed by the explain and relate, the one sentence summary, and finally, the thesis. It's so much better than this, right? Lesson learned, beware of TMI. The third rookie mistake I made was getting sucked into all the bells and whistles. Once I figured out the basics of using PowerPoint and Keynote and Google Slides, I started playing around with things like font and transitions and color and italics and bold and even GIFs. Because <laughs> who doesn't want goofy animated applause in a boring author bio presentation? What I've learned since then is to clear the clutter. Less really is more. The brain learns best when all the extraneous words and pictures and sounds are ruthlessly pruned away. Keep only what's essential for meeting the learning objective. Okay, on to rookie mistake number four. You know that saying that a picture's worth a thousand words? Well, my fourth rookie mistake was creating slides with no pictures, just a thousand words. Here's a gem from my student teaching days. In fact, it's from the very first slide deck I ever made to present to students. Look at all those words. Big bullet points, side-by-side -side bullet points, bold text, headings, and a weird random flower. This is a slide that was built to be a teleprompter. What went wrong here beyond reading a script was that I failed to activate both channels in my students' brains. We know that people learn better from words and pictures than from just words alone. At the very least, I should have cut down some of the text and given students an anchor image to hang all those words on. My fifth rookie mistake was that I just didn't understand how much design really matters. I didn't realize that the itty-bitty details in my slides, like font and layout and blank space, all contribute to how easy or hard it would be for my students to understand the concepts I was presenting. I know now that serif fonts, you know, the ones with the little mini lines at the end of each of the letter strokes, serif fonts are easier on the eye for reading printed text and long passages. This is because those little serifs help guide the eye from one letter to the next while staying on the same printed line. Now, on the other hand, sans serif fonts, those are the ones without the little lines, they're more legible on computer screens because sometimes lines are distracting on lower resolution screens. So that's why all the titles in this presentation have been in sans serif fonts, even though it kills me because I totally like the elegance of a serif font better, but that's beside the point. I also now know that white space gives the brain a break, makes text more readable, makes images pop, creates visual boundaries and invisible highlights. It's one of the key differences between my first intro slide and my second one. Finally, I now know that graphic designers, photographers, and artists alike all rely on something called the rule of thirds to balance and guide their work. Try this. Divide an image or a slide evenly in thirds, vertically and horizontally. Then look at where those lines intersect. Did you know that our eyes naturally gravitate to those intersecting points? Pretty cool, huh? So place your important elements of the presentation along those points, and you can harness invisible design power. Five rookie mistakes later, and I think I can finally assert that there can be life after death by PowerPoint. Special thanks to all the people who contributed to this presentation with ideas, theories, and awesome free Creative Commons licensed resources. Slides, script, and narration by Diana Neby with editing help from Matthew Mitchell, Melissa Kay, and Colette Roche. All of the theories and principles covered in this presentation come from Rich Mayer's Handbook of Multimedia Learning. 
This presentation design template is from Slides Carnival. Photographs are by Upsplash, Ricky Romero, and Moondigger, and all icons are from thenounproject.com. This is Diana Neeby. Thanks for watching.